so just allow me to do so. Otherwise, thank you so much, and uh, it's good to meet again. Cohort 9, we want to first start by congratulating you for your resilience. I know we still have one or two steps to the very end, but so far, uh, we can be able to uh, pause and say congratulations. And I'll just request uh, if you can get, uh, if you can be able to put your video on, since I know we are meeting from different cohorts, I think that will be good. Uh, so if you are in a place where you are comfortable putting the video on, uh, you can do so. Uh, secondly, I request you to get a small piece of paper, uh, maybe from an exercise book or a notebook, or uh, just a paper maybe from uh, the printing paper, any plain paper you can get around you. Uh, just get a plain paper. Uh, we'll do a simple exercise as we continue. So one, if you can put your video on, it will be good for the exercise. And two, please get a small piece of paper with you. Uh, have, re have it ready. And then we'll do a very simple exercise as we continue. Otherwise, uh, let me allow us to have a very brief introduction. You can uh, just mention uh, your name and the cohort, and probably also if, you're if it's okay with you, you can also mention your profession because we come from different uh, profession and different backgrounds. So just your name, your cohort, and probably your profession. I'll start with uh, uh, Robert Wamalwa. Uh, please uh, just introduce yourself. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, my name is uh, Robert Juma Omalo, uh, cohort nine. Um, I'm ready to present and uh, professionally, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, currently, I'm doing uh, lead technical consultancy in uh, energy, uh, water, and industrial plants. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I'll move on to John Obimo. John Obimo, Karibu. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Joseph. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Um, my name is John Obimo Omondi. I'm a teacher by profession. I was in Cod 8, and I'm so happy to have joined Cod 9 they are a big day today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Good to see you, John. Karib Sana. Uh, next, we'll have Masi. Masi Wanyoike. Masi, you can unmute and introduce yourself. Okay, so let me move to Morris Omondi. Good evening, team. Uh, I'm Morris Omondi uh, in cohort nine. I'm a businessman by profession, be precise in, in logistics for petroleum. Thank you so much, Morris. Uh, Sarah Joshua, please uh, introduce yourself. Yes, uh, good evening, colleagues. I'm Sarah Joshua, you can see from cohort 10. I'm a teacher by profession and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, let me move on to Ruben and then Nelson. Yeah, Ruben, you can unmute and introduce yourself. Uh, good evening. Good evening. How are you? My name is Ruben Ososo. I'm uh, just joining now, so I don't know. I'm just joining. I was invited by John. Uh, Bimo is my friend, uh, my teacher also, just like him. Thank you so much, Ruben. You're welcome. 
Ruth, Waweru, and then Esther. Good evening, how are you? Good evening. Uh, my name is Ruth, I'm from um, in cohort nine and uh, I am a business lady. I, I deal with printing, design and branding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, next we'll have Esther. Esther. And then we'll have uh, Chairman Peter Gidiomi. So let me move on to Peter Gidiomi as I'll get back to Esther later on. Mr. Gidiomi, you can uh, unmute and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, it looks like there is a, a problem with the network. Um, I'm a civil engineer and also I'm from the DCU Moya. I'm also in, with Morris and the team. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Gidiomi. We call him Chairman. Uh, then we'll move to Evelyn and then uh, Reverend Evanson. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Are you hearing me? Yes, Evelyn, we can hear you well. Okay, I'm um, Evelyn Atemo. I'm a teacher by profession and I'm in cohort 10. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Karib Sana. Uh, Reverend Evanson, uh, kindly introduce yourself. Good evening, team. Good evening. That is my name. I attended cohort five. And this far, the Lord has done great things in my life. This is a wonderful program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Reverend, for joining us this evening. I'll skip Rebecca. Rebecca, because of Echo, she's my wife, so she's seated close to where I am. I'll move on to Bernard Mwangi. Good evening, leaders. Good evening. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Mwangi, we can hear you well. Okay, thank you. I'm Bernard Mwangi. Good evening, leaders. Good evening. Yes, I attended cohort seven, awaiting graduation. I'm looking forward to that, uh, that day of graduation. Otherwise, uh, the, the learning has been good and we wish cohort nine and 10 a very successful uh, finishing, uh, even as they present their proposals. Welcome, Thank good evening. You. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mwangi. Uh, I'll move on to Eda Muigai. Uh, Eda, you can introduce yourself, please. Good evening, leaders. Good evening. Uh, my, my name is Eda Mugai. I'm, um, I'm from Deliverance Church, Kibikongo. And uh, I'm glad to be here once again. I was in cohort seven. Uh, I thank God. Thank you so much. I think the rest as they come on, uh, we'll request them to send their details on the chat. We'll read them through as we continue. Otherwise, uh, we want to maximize the opportunity we have this evening. It's a learning experience and uh, also part of networking. I know this has become the new norm. We are meeting online, interacting online. And it's good to see people like Edda, uh, cohort seven, Good to see uh, Reverend Evanson all the way from cohort five. Uh, it's a great pleasure just to continue learning. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, I request those who can be able to have their video on in about one minute or so, we'll do a very simple exercise. So I just request you to have a, a small piece of paper, a plain one. I'll give you an opportunity to get a small piece of paper, a plain. Uh, again, after that, you can put your video on. We'll do a simple exercise and then we'll get to the presentations uh, right away. So let me give you a minute. Just probably you need to position yourself well. Uh, you need to, to, to tune the lighting and also to get a piece of paper and a pen. And then I'll give you further instructions. So let's do that uh, in 30 seconds or in one minute. I'm also getting mine ready. Good, so uh, you have your paper ready and I, I think we'll work with those who have their videos on. The rest you can just follow uh, behind the scenes because we'll be seeing what we are doing. So with your paper, uh, just let me see your paper if it's, you have it ready. Okay, I can see a number of you have your papers ready, uh, but we are very few. Uh, I can only see Evelyn. Uh, is there anybody else with a paper ready? Okay. Yeah. Ah, great, great. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to draw a circle. Uh, draw a circle. Uh, draw a circle on that paper. And then draw letter A. Draw a circle. <laughs> and then draw letter A. In the, inside the, the circle middle. or outside the circle? Okay, for now, for now, just draw, uh, just draw letter A. Just draw a circle and then draw letter A for now. In the middle, okay. <laughs> okay. So once you are done, uh, uh, please display your paper. We want to see how it how it is. Okay, no, it may not be very clear. May not be very clear. Yeah, I can see. Some of you drew capital letters. Uh, I think most most are capital letters. Any small letter, uh, capital letters. Okay, okay. Okay, let's do part B. That is part one. Part B, I want you to fold that paper in half. Fold the paper in half. And then fold again in half. Okay, and then unfold the paper 
unfold the paper. Then on the upper square on the, on the left, the upper square on the left, draw a circle. In the upper square, draw a circle. And then draw uh, letter A in capital letters, touching the upper part of the circle and the lower part of the circle. Okay, and then once you are done, uh, display your paper again. And display your paper and try to check your neighbor's paper, how they look like. And uh, let me see. So are they now identical? Are you able to see a paper that is identical to yours this time round? I know even the first round, there was quite a number which were identical. Wow. Now, Edda, uh, you had a question. We can get to your question now. Thank you. What is the difference between the first instruction and the second instruction? Or the first part A and part B of this exercise? And maybe... Uh, the, the, uh -huh. Yes, Edda? When you, told us to, when you told us to draw letter A, the first one, you did not tell us where you're going to draw it. But the second one, you have told us to where you're going to draw it. Yeah, very true. Uh -huh. Let me take uh, one more, uh, two more, two, just two comments on this exercise. And also maybe we can try and link it from what we have been doing in class. Just two more. Uh, let's grab the opportunity as quickly as possible, two more. as we prepare the presentation for the groups. Uh -huh. Any comment from the, 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 the rest of the team? Uh, everybody, uh, we are not all the same. We don't think the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't think the same. Very true interpretation. I want more. One more comment. Or I can volunteer someone for this one more. Mr. Mwangi, your comment on this? <clears throat> okay. Hello? Uh, yes, Mr. Mwangi. Hello. Oh, we are together. Okay. The instruction was one to all of us, but the interpretation of the instruction appears to be different. Eh? Mm -hmm. The first instruction was a plain paper to draw a circle to draw letter A. So at that point, you, the instruction was was not clear as to part of the of the paper would draw the circle and the paper, whether in the middle or at the sides. Then we folded the paper into half twice and unfolded. Then we drew a circle at the right left hand corner of the paper, and writing a letter A, touching from one side of the circle to the other side of the circle. But from what it appears is that. The instructions were the same, but the results were different. Very, very Th that's true. That's my, my, my comment. Yeah, so the issue of interpretation, I can see Edda, our understanding is different from the chat. And basically from this masterclass, I think we started from uh, appreciating perspectives and we said uh, as leaders, we lead different people with different understanding, different backgrounds. And therefore, one of the things or one of the
culture that we have developed in the masterclass is to appreciate uh, the perspectives and also try to understand the other person's perspectives or perspective. Probably the person might see what you're not seeing. And uh, secondly, it's the issue of details. I think uh, we learned like problem solving techniques, just going, be be going beyond the, the surface. Uh, you might be told to draw an A, but uh, that is the instruction. And some of you indicated or took that direction. We went be beyond just knowing what to do. And we also want to understand how do we do it? And again, beyond that, we want to understand why are we doing it? Or why are we undertaking that activity? So this has been our, uh, our policy from the very beginning perspectives, uh, being triple loop learners, going beyond uh, the details, uh, wanting to really get to the root cause of issues, especially if you're dealing with problems, and uh, also the issue of communication. So I just felt we just do like a, a recap, a very simple recap of where, where we have we started all the way from the triple loop learning, the, the six eyes, and we walked through the managers versus uh, leaders. And the journey has been really exciting, I believe, even for the cohort uh, nine as they climax today. So this is their day. And I just want to pave way so that we listen through uh, what they have prepared. Uh, they will do a very, they have done quite a lot, but uh, for the presentation, uh, they will just summarize uh, whatever they have uh, prepared. And uh, after that, we'll allow some comments because uh, some of these project proposals uh, will proceed. They will proceed with the project proposals uh, to the next level. So your comment will really help them to fine tune uh, their proposals. So I'll just want you to take some notes. Uh, we may not allow, we may not have enough time to uh, give a chance for everyone to speak, but you can also put some comments on the chat as you listen through. And then hopefully I'll also be able to take you through uh, another project uh, as we conclude, just to be able to share our experience and knowledge. So I'll start with uh, Robert, uh, Tim and uh, Mr. Gidiomi. Uh, and then we'll move on to the rest, to the next group. So let me share, and as I do this, uh, Robert, you can take it up, introduce your team, and then move on. So Robert Wamalwa, you can take it up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Kieria. Uh, my name is As Said, and I'm going to present a project proposal titled Recycling of Used Engine Oil. Uh, with me, the project team is as seen there in the first slide, Peter Kidiomi and myself, Robert Wamalwa. Uh, quickly, without um, wasting much time, let's move. Huh? And go to the next slide. Yeah, now I'm going to do the introduction. Uh, the introduction is uh, that the world demand for lubrication, lubricant oil is about 41.35 million metric tons. The regional distribution, <clears throat> the regional distribution of, I think uh, you can make it smaller a bit, uh, so that I can get it clear. As you see in Africa, the consumption is about 2.068 million metric tons of the global lubricant consumption. Now within Africa, we have like in South Africa, they consume about 0 .35, 0 0.305 million metric tons of the African quarter oil. In Kenya, we consume about 0 
0.007 million metric tons of duplicating oils. So this duplicating oil become degraded after use. Uh, so during uh, during that period of time, there is presence of contaminants. It's not once it has been used, it's not fit for it is intended purpose or it is intended use again, and it requires to be disposed. And the improper handling and transportation of the same treatment and disposal of the used oils result in negative environmental and public health hazards. So you find that as you know, oil is insoluble, persistent, and toxic to to additives and uh, heavy metals. Hence, can be a major source of contamination of uh, groundwater if indiscriminately disposed. Under the environmental management coordination, you find that uh, water quality is affected, and the regulation that was passed in 2006, uh, the effluent discharge standard for oil and grease, uh, is actually zero because the impacts of oil on drinking water can be devastating. Generally, infrastructure facilities relating to the storage, transportation, and recycling have also been inadequate in absence of clear guidelines. So these guidelines will contribute to reduction of pollution due to unsound management of used uh, oil, particularly in particular, they expound the requirements stipulated in part four and specified in the fourth section of the environmental management and coordination, that's waste management. Uh, regulations 2006 on management of uh, hazardous waste the guidelines may be complemented with the energy and petroleum regulatory authority and the environmental hazard and safety guidelines and the source of this is uh, as shown there uh, from the web uh, website of nema that's when you can where you can get the information about the lubricant and the guidelines on how to dispose the same uh, we can move to the sec to the next slide problem statement it has been established that uh, the majority of the people are not aware of the magnitude of waste oil problem in the environment also lack of knowledge on environmental hazards of waste oil pollution uh, this suggests that the uh, initiatives taken to address the problem of waste uh, oil management has not fully involved the uh, stakeholders so in particular there is need to put in place a mechanisms that stakeholders or uh, uh, players involvement in waste oil management activities, which is very, very mandatory. Kenya lacks an official registered organization to initiate concrete <coughs> Uh, waste oil recycling, uh, the sustainable motivation and uh, justification, motivation, justification. That is in the second, in the next slide. Uh, you find that uh, the motiv what motivated or uh, what was the motivation or justification for this? They used oil from one oil change. That is as you change only one because you find that it can contaminate one million gallons of fresh water. So it only takes one cup of used motor oil to put an oil sheen on a one acre pond. The United States produces 1.3 billion gallons of waste oil each year, of which uh, you find that I think the number is here. It's heated. Gallons are recycled almost uh, 40 percent. That's about 800 million uh, gallons are recycled. And with 500 million, that's which accounts for 40 percent is not being recycled. If all the waste oil in the United States was recycled in a single year, it would uh, save uh, an output of the Alaskan pipeline for the same period of time. So recycled oil motor. Recycled used motor oil can be refined into new oil, processed into fuels, fuel oils, 
and then uh, as a raw material for the petroleum industry. That can become a raw material for the petroleum industry. One gallon of used motor oil provides the same 2.5 quarts of lubricating oil as that one of crude oil. So if all the oil from American do it yourself, when you talk of do it, American, you do it yourself, that is DIY, uh, that is when you do it, you change the oil for yourself. Oil changes was recycled. It will be actually of great value because it will be produced a motor oil for more than 50 million cars in a year. And the source for that information is as shown, you can check in that website, www.machinerylubrication.com. Uh, that is, so we go to general objectives. The general objective of the project is to evaluate the social based waste oil recycling system in order to recommend effective and sustainable measures and implement measures for attaining uh, project sustainability. We have the specific objectives, which are about five. To examine the method used in disposal of waste oil and community awareness uh, for waste oil disposal problems in the country. To analyze the stakeholders' involvement in management of waste oils and the uh, uh, registered uh, governing regards governing used oil in the country. To assess the stakeholders' attitude on recycling system for waste oils in the country. To identify factors influencing effectiveness of operating waste oil recycling system in the country. And then finally, to recommend and implement intervention for improving waste oil disposal in the country. Uh, those are the specific objectives. I can move to uh, study questions. The study questions will have to answer the specific objectives. So what are the methods used for waste oil disposal in the country? Are the stakeholders aware of waste oil disposal problems in environment? In what ways are key stakeholders involved in waste oil recycling system? What are the factors that affect used oil disposal system in the country? And what are the factors influencing effectiveness of operating waste oil recycling system in the country? Uh, can move the next slide. The literature review. So here, the literature review is reviewed with a clear focus on waste oil management. It entails what people have done or conceptualized on the same topic. The major areas covered in the included We seem to have lost uh, Robert. Hello, Robert. Okay. Yeah, we seem to have lost Robert. Yeah, uh, Chairman, probably you can move on. As we try to get uh, to get him back on. Can you get to get me? Peter, if, if, if Peter is able to continue, he can pick up from there. Sawa, sawa. I, I can be able to do that. Okay, get me? Peter, uh, if, if Peter is able to continue, he can... Okay, Chairman, uh, you can proceed. The literature. Okay, you are getting me? Yes, we are getting you well. Yes, we, we can hear you. Ah, okay. Okay, so uh, the, the literature review, uh, the, the, I think read the, the theoretical part of the literature review covers the general information collected from different sources on the same topic where the empirical literature summarizes information cited from different authors who studied the topic on waste oil management. Uh, the policy review section summarizes existing regional and national policies 
uh, the way it influences the community development. And uh, most of the literature is from Europe, America, Asia countries, because these countries have advanced practices on waste oil management. A lot of projects and research Sorry. in the area have been done in these countries. Sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. That's a problem with technology. Thank you. Ah, uh, okay. You, yeah. Then so, you can pick from. Okay. Continue from the conceptual and okay. theoretical literature reviews. Right. The next slide. Okay. Okay. Conceptual. Yeah. Thank you very much. We can now move to. Also, I was on a. As a sort of normal use uh, motto. Okay. According to U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, used motor oil is any petroleum now with fine what used motor oil. Any petroleum-based or synthetic oil that has been used for vehicle lubrication, as a result of normal use, motor oil becomes contaminated with various impurities such as dirt, water, chemicals, or tools for engine. Some government jurisdictions classify used motor oil as a source. It may contain additives, e.g. rust inhibitors, contaminants, e.g. heavy metals, directed through engineering or external refused materials such as nice is for old transformer oils, potentially carcinogenic, polycyclic aromatic compounds, which comes from fuel combustion process, a process of fuel combustion in the combustion or dry liquid from the cooling system. Because of these impurities, used motor oil should be handled with care and disposed of quickly to ensure the use of the local community environment and waterways. That is from American Petroleum Institute uh, research that was done in 2006. Uh, so we can move to the next slide methodology. In this case, we did not a systematic process of collecting data for the research problem, approach and strategies to be employed to start the research problem technically, to cover the project design location, sampling techniques, types and sources of data, data collection methods, sample size and data analysis uh, techniques used in the country. Yeah, so we move to the results and uh, findings. Uh, in this case, as I've suggested, as we have suggested in the methodology, uh, results and finding are going to be based on the sampling techniques. Uh, like here, results methods used in disposal of waste oil in the study are as follows. Now we are trying to answer part of this in disposal of of waste oil in the study, we have discard to the environment, collect and store for further use, used in control of factor insects in pit latrines. Uh, there is survey for 80 people. You find that 31 uh, of that uh, are they acknowledge discard to the environment. That one we say that collect and store for further use, and 18 they use they have the idea of using it for control of factors, that's like the, so the, that is the, the figure, those are the figures. We move to the next slide, which now explains what all this uh, is all about. Next slide. You can see the survey, survey carried out by the team. Hello? It looks like it's stuck or what? Okay. Oh, oh no. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now so you can now see. you find that the, the source, the source, yeah, I can see it. Yes. Now the source, the source for the survey, the source is just our own source from the survey that is carried out by the team that as we have been doing it in 2021. And the results in the table above shows that at 38, as you have seen, you know, I don't have even need to go into my details because you have already seen what has been done. And 38.8% is cut waste oil, haphazard, 
uh, store waste oil for further use in the blast furnace and as a wood preservatives against times by termites, while the remaining 22.4 of the respondents uh, use waste oil in control of factor insects in the pit like field. So this oil discussed direct to the environment are a response for waste oil pollution, thus posing community risks and loss of biodiversity. From the findings, 30.8 of students collect the waste oils and sell it to local industries where it is used in gas funds. This is uh, some kind of recycle of used oil with potential for generating incomes. The process of waste collection, storage, and transportation is being carried out by unemployed youths use very poor equipment like uh, hand trolleys. They don't handle it um, well because they don't have knowledge how to do that. So we come to the next slide. Okay, I hope it can be, you can see it now. Next slide. I think there is some delay, but it's coming. Uh, okay, so furthermore, the youths who are engaged in waste oil caution lacks the proper protective gears, consequently, they need to protect their skins nor their mouth by, pro by protection wear. For this reason, the youths involved in the recycling of used oil are increasingly exposed to occupational hazards. The results, the results study show that 22.4 of respondents quit and use waste oil for control of fake insects. Those are flies and mosquitoes in pit greens. So this product, while it is beneficial in control of fake insects, may also give to it give rise to other unintended environmental problems. The waste oil can interfere with the biodiversity by showing the microflora that plays part in the composition of organic matter, including the uh, excrement. This is this turn may lead to an condition and in the composition of excrem excrement. So increasing foul smell as well as increased um, biological oxygen demand level in water hence to the community. Go to the next slide. Okay, stakeholders involvement. Uh, that is uh, all about that. The, the second one, the table number two, it shows the involvement of the players or stakeholders in waste oil management in the industry in the in the in this study, uh, in collaboration with the researcher. Now us. Now you find that as it is stipulated there, uh, we wanted to know uh, how many leaders are involved and how many are also involved in inspection and how many are those which are involved in the communities and so many do not know anything about the environment and uh, waste oils. So 25 uh, of them, they are not involved. Uh, six, are they are only involved in inspection. And in community sensitization, you find that out of 40, we have seven. And those who don't know anything, there are, there are two. So two out of 40, and the percentages are as, as given. And now the source for this is through the survey that was collected. You move to the next slide. So the results that the majority of respondents, 62.5% acknowledge that polluters were not involved at any stage in waste oil management. 15% of the respondents say that local leaders are only involved during inspection. 17.5% of the respondents get involved only during consensitization. A small proportion of respondents, that's 5%, were not aware if local leaders are involved in waste management in this. project as the major stakeholder from the community. Community representatives uh, as community representatives, they command high risk among the community members who believe that from their local leaders or from their own leaders. 
So we move to the next slide. Uh, then this is about the local leaders on existing environmental laws and regulations. The same say was done with the uh, the response. And uh, you find that only six out of 40 understand the existing environmental laws. That the four, uh, which accounts to 85%, not understand the existing environmental laws at all at all. Percentage was uh, out of 100, and uh, the number of respondents was 40, so everything out of 40. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So local leaders reside in the table number three above shows that 85% of the respondents are not aware of the existing environmental laws, and only 15% of the respondents understand the existing environmental laws. Local leaders are formal leaders who are elected by the community members as local reps to the government. So leaders may have ten roles in waste or management. These roles include the uh, enforcement of the bylaws, presentation of community participation in environmental management activities, communication with county authorities, and the uh, level in the government or national government as well as communication based organizations. So the study suggests that uh, of this we came out with a suggestion that the state of local leaders participation on environment issues could be compromised by their ignorance of existing environmental laws and regulations. Therefore, the local leaders' capacity building through training on legal matter is one area which needs to be improved. Uh, so that one, the source is a survey that you conducted. So finally, factors affecting waste oil management, the research established the factors that affect used oil disposal system and the cause of waste oil pollution in the city. Uh, there is a table, table six, uh, table four there. So there is in the table, we shall look at it. Uh, table four indicates that 2%, 2.5% of respondents believe that waste oil pollution is caused by lack of knowledge and the public awareness. So the fact that it is lack of knowledge, public awareness, and also um, with um, lack of concrete project dealing, especially the projects that with the proper waste oil management is also a factor. And also you find that uh, the, prefer the lack of capital and failing poverty affects and it is a, it causes the waste oil issue. And then also to poor government policy, uh, they are not being enforced. So they also, they cause that. So the depot is a scene, a lack of knowledge, awareness among the public, lack of concrete project dealing with waste oil, lack of capital and party and the others, as is just about the government policies that are in place. So we move to a conclusion. And recommendation. Now, you can see, based on the study analysis of the results of concrete and effective pro dealing with waste oil management, lack of capital, lack of uh, public awareness and the knowledge about waste oil management identified as the major sources of waste oil in the country, the, pub the public lack of knowledge, environment hazards, nature of waste oil pollution, and associated community risks. The research indicates that local leaders and the other stakeholders' involvement in the waste oil management like this initiated is very poor, and most of the stakeholders are not aware about organizations' activities and its performance. <clears throat> Next slide. Recommendation the organization to be registered officially and initiate concrete public based waste recycling system project, which emphasize public participation in order to attain sustainable environmental protection, the organization should try to find their source of funds rather than member, member contributions such as grants and loans from banks for citizens or uh, for the people or citizens.
and the policy makers to develop alternatively for use. The government should modernize the waste oil management activities for the environment and public health protection in the cities and the whole nation at large. The government and the government organization should provide credit facilities to the community-based organization and NGOs dealing with waste oil recycling projects because shortage of funds is the one is one of the main cause of low performance on the waste oil management projects in the country. Government to promote waste oil management by educating the public and all stakeholders on the environmental hazards of waste oil and the need for proper management progress programs. The government and non-government organizations should provide funds to youth groups, especially those dealing with waste oil management that will enable them to operate more efficient, more efficient waste oil management projects or concrete project management, uh, oil management projects. So we move to the final, and I think that one is now the references from what we have done, um, from what we have come through. These are the places we tried to read and decode some information from. So that's when you go there, you will get to know, uh, you will get some of that information. And uh, that's all about the project. We have not included the budget and the, the timeline for this project. The time, the, 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 uh, if I talk about the budget a little bit is that, you know, the budget uh, is uh, that, you know, you have a team, you will organize for a seminar, for survey as you move the realities and what have you, logistics. So that one given time, as we progress with the proposal, we shall have to be able to come up with a concrete budget on that. Otherwise, I rest the case and I say thank you very much for the time to listen to this. God bless you. Wow, let's uh, appreciate uh, the team. You can appreciate them in your own style, either digital or uh, the other one. Hello, it's well done, well done, Tim Gidiomi and Tim uh, Robert. Well, for the interest of time, we are going just to take two comments. I'll take two comments, uh, and then the rest can come through the chat uh, so that we pave way for Team Two, and hopefully I'll also get time to present something if time allows. So just two comments, and then the rest of us we can share on the chat. So. Whoever wants to go first, please, you can do that as quickly as possible for the interest of time. I know the language, the topic might be uh, another one, but depending with our profession and our background, but I'm sure there is something probably we can comment either in terms of the presentation, terms of the structure, or terms of the content. Uh, let me allow Reverend Everson to go first. Oh, uh, it was my my class. I thought he was raising his hand. So anybody wants to go first? Any comment for the team? It was nicely done, and they have done uh, a good research. Yeah, so good research, nicely done. I see on the chat. Uh, on the chat, uh, let me pick a few comments from the chat. Uh, okay, uh, Esther says, wow, that's a workable project which can help our society, great job. Uh, Bernard, congratulations, cohort nine. Uh, good research work, a lot of ignorance by the public. Yeah, so generally, the it's a positive uh, indication, if, especially in terms of uh, offering a solution. You see that that's uh, the thinking behind our project's proposals. Uh, there is a challenge out there and we have the capacity to be able to come on board and be able to offer a solution. So this is a solution. And I'm thinking from my side, from my side as I prepare for the next team to uh, present, I just have a few comments from my side. 
one i think the the, the focus is mostly on uh, factors affecting uh, the recycling uh, that's what i can see probably we can just fine tune that topic a little bit because so that we just focus on the factors affecting uh, the recycling uh, of used oil project so that because the direction that your research is taking uh, it's something that probably can be published because you have done already some survey so if you just move on you can fine tune the topic uh, the title sorry uh, then you just focus on the factors and uh, see if it's something that you can uh, either publish or either publishing I, I mean I mean uh, maybe an academic or a journal or you can also it's part of the uh, papers that can inform policies especially on the stakeholders because we have some stakeholders who can be the beneficiary of the work that you have done so generally uh, the most the mood is positive and uh, I think we are encouraging you to move on uh, so that we see next time when we're having such presentation, we can get maybe some update on what you've been able to achieve, but uh, we're giving you a notes up uh, just to keep on uh, pushing the project forward. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, Chairman Gidiomi, maybe you can just share a comment, uh, especially on the process, how the process has been. Uh, in less than a minute, you can share your experience of the team, and then I'll allow the other team to proceed. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerry, for the opportunity. As uh, you have noted, uh, quite a bit of work has gone into it, this, a uh, bit of research. Uh, when we, as a team, we agreed that uh, what project we come up with, uh, myself, because of the line I'm pursuing, uh, I had something else. And then uh, Robert also had this particular one. This is his. This is a real, a real pet project for Robert. You and the passion is there, and uh, we. I'm going to work with him until we see the full implementation of this. So, because we believe there is a lot of potential, and there is a, uh, as you said, it is going to solve an environmental problem, employment, and all that. So, uh, the time was short to really tune it. But uh, we thank God that we have reached where we are. Thank you. And how was the experience uh, of the team? Uh, some challenge, some lessons you can share with us? Uh, especially the, the critical thinking that, uh, that had to go into it and to harmonize my thinking and his thinking, and then we see uh, from which side are we looking at? You, you know, we are trying to solve a problem. So who, who is supposed to benefit from this or whom do we have in mind? That kept on, you know, that is so critical that who is going to be, be the benefit of this project? I think that is one of the areas that uh, really we had to keep on focusing on. So I think that's, that's what I can say. Okay. So uh, we'll pause there. I know we can uh, engage more on this uh, project, but because of time, let's pause there. Uh, we'll keep the discussion going. Otherwise, uh, allow me now to welcome the next team uh, to proceed. That is Maurice, uh, Steve, uh, Nelson, and Joe. Uh, so Nelson, I think you'll take it up and uh, continue. Yes, thank you, Mr. Kiari for this opportunity. So I'm here to present uh, our cohort nine uh, project uh, that my team members are Maurice Omondi, Steve Moravi Nelson, me, myself, and Job Gilato. Yep. So you can move to the next slide. So our introduction is, through an experience of COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, almost, just a minute.
Through an experience of COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, our economy almost collapsed due to us being net importers of almost everything we consume in day-to-day -day operations. Kenya has made considerable progress with proper, pro poverty reductions pre-COVID, but after COVID struck, it destroyed the livelihoods of many Kenyans, pushing almost 2 million people to absolute poverty. This uh, is uh, as per result done by the World Bank as uh, the reference uh, shown below there. Approximately 50% of our employed workforce lost their jobs, sources of livelihood, and the ones who remained, and who remained employed are in firms that are facing high risk of high risk of temporary or permanent closure and reduced revenues. Those actively looking, this is as per the National Bureau of Statistics survey done in uh, 2019. Then we have realized that this could not have been the situation if we were manufacturing and consuming our local products at a higher scale than now and wouldn't have been adversely affected by the global value chain disruptions caused by this pandemic. To mitigate this, we therefore are encouraging and are focused in creating awareness on consumption of locally manufactured goods to cushion us from such occurrences now and in the future. Instead, we are going to be the people exporting more, creating more employment and building generational wealth. Developing a strategy on Buy Kenya, Build Kenya is one of the measures whose effective implementation will go a long way in enhancing Kenya's competitiveness and consumption of locally produced goods and services. That's our introduction. Our main objectives are to create awareness on the importance of consuming locally manufactured goods and its benefits to the economy. Then we have our secondary objectives, which are to generate traction on volumes of export in the country in order to overcome the current trade imbalance and become net exporter, become a net exporter. Also to develop import substitution policies for basic goods. The second one is to create more employment opportunities due to expansion of the local industries as a result of increased demand and consumption for locally manufactured products. Then we have to recommend strategies and policies that need to be implemented in order to develop a stronger economy that can sustain uncertainties like the current COVID-19. Okay. Our problem statement states that people have a higher affinity for imported goods than for locally manufactured or assembled goods. This creates an imbalance in the value chain a weaker currency and lack of development and innovativeness in the economy. We need to change this mindset through creating awareness, advocacy, aggressive marketing, and ensuring consumption and availability of quality products, both locally and internationally. According to the World Bank report on Kenya's imports and exports, the total value of exports is US dollars 6,050 million, while the total value of imports is US dollars 17,377 million. Kenya's exports of goods and services as a percentage of GDP is 13.18, and imports of goods and services as a percentage of GDP is 23.01%. This ideally makes Kenya a net importer of goods and services and creates a negative trade balance and hence weakens the shilling. This is as per the World Bank report. Then we move on to our motivation for doing the study. Currently, the unemployment rate in Kenya is too high due to us being net consumers of imported goods. Kenya's unemployment rate now stands at 10.4% from 5.2%, with the employment to population ratio sliding to 57.7% from 64.4% in 2019. The number of graduates in Kenya exceeds the number of available job opportunities. And according to a survey done by the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, each year, 50,000 students graduate from universities across the country. And out of these, only 10,000 are lucky to find any meaningful employment. Kenya ranks as the best East African country in terms of gross domestic product, it's the third best country in Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of ease of doing business. And by that, we mean the business environment. 
and it's the fourth best sub-Saharan country in terms of logistics and infrastructure. This is as per the Ken Invest uh, page for government of Kenya. This means that Kenya already has a very conducive environment for doing business and manufacturing, but what's lacking is the awareness to attract foreign direct investment to grow and strengthen our economy. When locally manufactured goods and services are accorded preferential marketing awareness and local and international market access by the public and private sector, synergy is created that contributes towards building a robust value chain that integrates agricultural advancements, industrial developments, and a service base that nurture wealth generation, increased job opportunities, and a self-sufficient economy. Our methodology, uh, we did a benchmarking of uh, the United States and South Korea, and it was as a benchmarking with the global best practices revealed that many countries have protected their own industries, struck local production and created awareness and availability of their products to the local and international markets such countries include the USA, where the Congress has board authority to place conditions on the purchases made by the federal government or with federal dollars. One of many conditions that it has placed on direct government purchases is a requirement that they, they be produced in the United States. The most familiar of these requirements is known as the Buy American Act, which is the major domestic preference statute governing procurement by the federal government. Our countries with uh, other countries with similar initiatives for promoting, promoting domestic industry and lo local economy include Ghana, China, Malaysia, leather and leather products in Ethiopia and Tanzania. A bigger threat to local procurement policies may lie in the international trade agreements that contain provisions that make local preferences vulnerable to challenges and in some cases even aim to explicitly, explicitly undo them. These arrangements and the rules of the World Trade Organizations that oversees them can water down the policies put in place by the government. This is as, this is as per the World Investment Report in uh, 2011. So the next uh, benchmarking we used was uh, uh, for South Korea. Uh, we can see that we almost got our independence at the same time uh, as South Korea, but if you compare the two economies now and uh, what's happening in South Korea between Kenya and South Korea, South Korea are miles ahead of us and we are not even sure if we will ever catch up with them. So South Korea is so much more developed and Kenya, as per the current status we are in, we are still suffering inflation, uh, lack of employment, and uh, poor poli policy implementation strategies. So that's a comparison we did between Kenya and uh, South Korea. And uh, we have picked some of the policies they implemented, which you're going to see them ahead in our strategies. So we can uh, move to the, to the next slide. So our findings, uh, we came up with this. The country is in the middle of a perfect storm and the declining and weakening shilling is the most visible manifestation of Kenya's economic woes. The main reason why Kenya's economy is increasingly imbalanced is due to the lack of awareness, advocacy, and consumption of locally manufactured goods and dependency on imports. I'll skip to the next paragraph, which says that Kenyans are only aware of 34.5% of agricultural products produced locally, 17.8% of locally manufactured goods, and 47.5% of services offered locally. This averagely sums up to 33.26% awareness of the local population on locally available goods and services. This is as per the Wikipedia. Uh, on the economy of Kenya. So we can see how uh, poorly we are doing on the awareness of our locally manufactured products. If we are uh, averaging doing 33.26%, uh, 
out of everything we produce and uh, manufacture locally, then we still have a long way to go. So we can also see some of the other reasons as to why poor awareness and consumption of local products is the thriving of illicit trade. Counterfeit goods are smuggled into the country and sold at a cheaper price than the locally manufactured one. This makes the consumers opt for the cheaper options due to low spending power, and that's making it harder for manufacturers to push their more quality goods and products and get a share of the local market. And then uh, our manufacturing industry has also declined greatly. As we can see that uh, it stagnated several years ago, and uh, we are not able to meet even the local demands for our own population. And this is due to the la lack of uh, consumption, which doesn't create demand for our locally available products. Therefore, it forces the local manufacturers to close down shop and render people unemployed. So those are some of the findings that we came up with. So we can go to the next slide. So part of our strategies uh, that we came up with is uh, we need to create awareness through the media, aggressive advertisements, social media presence, mass text messaging, and partnering with willing media outlets to push the awareness agenda. We came up with uh, branding and ambassadors. We are training and recruiting brand ambassadors who will champion a movement for Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, coordinating branding of locally manufactured goods through engaging private sector as Kenya, such as Kenya Association of Manufacturers and other business member associations, and also engage the Kenya Export Promotion Council to push and promote our local brands visibility locally and uh, abroad. We also came up with uh, to develop a synergy framework between government agencies and the private sector to, peer, to spearhead consumption and awareness of, for locally manufactured goods to facilitate market access, both domestically and internationally, to foster import substitution, improve opportunities for public procurement contracts and offer sub subsidies and incentives to our manufacturing companies. So we also came up with, uh, we need to conduct a skill gap analysis and provide interventions through trainings, advocacy groups, and training of trainers and policies that will ensure development and implementation of human skills development that connects effectively to the labor market needs. Because you find what people are studying in school and what the industries need out here are two very different things. So you find graduates who are not able to uh, integrate directly into the ready uh, job market or manufacturing companies because uh, whatever skills and knowledge that they have acquired doesn't link up or connect effectively to the labor market needs. So we also came up with, we need to engage the Ministry of ICT and other ICT firms and agencies to integrate digitization in the manufacturing and awareness domain and encourage global business to business matchmaking with local businesses on e-commerce platforms like Alibaba to enable our products access global market. So these are some of the strategies we came up with. And uh, we also did a SWOT analysis of the, uh, this is basically the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats that we face as a country and our economy. So I'll just go through them quickly. So one of them, one of the strengths is that uh, we are located strategically uh, as a regional economic hub in East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. We have uh, well-established financial institutions that includes banks and other microfinance uh, lending institutions. Then we have supportive policy environment uh, that, have, that we have bodies like the National Trade Policy, Export Promotion Strategy, the National Industrial Strategy, and one village, one product, among others that have offered the catalyst support required to the development of niche products to encourage inter-county trade and increased market share globally. So those are some of the strengths we have. We can go to the next slide. And um, 
we are our weaknesses uh, that we have. So one of them is the ineffective enforcement of regulations. We have policies, but uh, they are not really enforced and implemented as it's supposed to be done. And then we also have the high cost of credit and limited access to finance, especially for small and micro enterprises. And then we also have the high cost of doing business in the country due to uh, low levels of research and development, weak and or lack of entrenched anti-dumping and antitrust law and regulations, loose border controls, and goods important under the pretext of second hand products are some of the key challenges that are facing uh, Kenya as we work towards being uh, bigger manufacturers. So we can move to the next slide. So we also have opportunities and some of the key opportunities that we have as Kenya is that uh, we should take advantage of the global arena, include facilities such as the African Growth and Opportunity Act, the AGOA, membership and participation. So in short, we have so many world organizations that we are members of, and these are opportunities for us to market our products uh, both locally uh, regionally and abroad. So if we just engage these bodies in the best way possible, we are able to reach a wider global market and thus able to push our products uh, to a bigger market share. Then we have some of the threats that are affecting us. Uh, we have steep competition from global com commodities as a result of international trade treaties. All bodies are an advantage to us. They're also at to us because uh, we have treaties that we sign in between countries that regionally and uh, internationally we have the case of China and Tanzania which we did recently so when we really want to push our locally produced uh, goods into the country and abroad we also need to accommodate uh, let's say products from Tanzania because we already had agreements with them that if we export our products to them then we'll also have to accept their products into our country. So this also affects our agenda of really having to do away with the importation of basic goods and products, uh, which internally goes back with the policies that we will have implemented in order to achieve our Buy Kenya, Build, build Kenya agenda. So we can go to the next slide. So we have our recommendations and conclusions. Uh, we need to create awareness through partnerships with the local and international media houses to promote person to, and promote person-to-person -person communication to enable people to understand the value of consuming locally manufactured products. We also need to integrate and strengthen the linkages between universities, research and development institutions, middle-level colleges, polytechnics, and other training institutions, and Department of State responsible for industrialization to undertake joint market-driven research for commercialization and awareness. We need to lobby the government to develop and implement a legal and regulatory framework to guide public procurement and awareness, offer subsidies to local manufacturers like low interest rate policy loans, give incentives and various preferential tax treatments such as tax exemptions and tax rebates. We also need to lobby the government to promote a conducive environment and infrastructure for local investment and investors to produce products that are globally competitive in price, quality, and quantity. We, in conclusion, we recommend that awareness of locally manufactured goods should be a continuous process and programs be headed and championed by our local and national leaders of our nation. Every person and child should be made aware that by consuming locally manufactured goods, they are creating wealth and employment for themselves and future generations. So this is part of our implementation matrix and budgets that we came up with. So this is basically our strategies. And then we have the activities that are supposed to be done under each strategy. And then we have the budget, and then the number of years that will take to complete each strategy and implement the activities that are stipulated under each strategy. 
So this is just a breakdown of the activities that need to be undertaken. And because uh, we've already gone through the strategies, we don't need really to go through the activities. Then the, the next slide shows our references where we got our data, literature review, our benchmark sources, and uh, all the information that we have in the report. So this is what we came up with uh, as a cohort nine with my team members, Maurice, Steve, uh, and Job. And just to conclude, uh, if you might not remember anything, you can remember this, that even our own president, uh, Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, currently wears locally manufactured uh, clothes from the Rivertex uh, plant in Eldoret. And uh, what he's basically just trying to do is, he's trying to show you that uh, we need to embrace our own. We've had this Buy Kenya, Build Kenya previously, but what really comes out uh, clearly from the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, Magical Kenya, all these slogans that are being spearheaded by the country is that uh, the, 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 the agenda for pride is really being brought out clearly, but they are not really pushing the main reason why they're spearheading these uh, Buy Kenya, Build Kenya. So for us, we want to help you understand the purpose for Buy Kenya, Build Kenya in that, let's say we really produce a lot of goods locally. Let's get, take an example of rice, which uh, most people go to the supermarket and buy rice from uh, other, other countries like Pakistan, uh, United States. When you buy this rice uh, from other countries, what you're doing basically is your money that you've worked hard for here in Kenya, you are exporting it back to those other countries. And what will happen to our local rice industry, the farmers will lose out on uh, where to take their rice because the manufacturers won't need that rice because the demand will be very low. On the other hand, where you're taking that your money by buying, let's say Pakistani rice, the Pakistani is coming from Kenya. So this basically needs there'll be open companies in their country and creating more employment opportunities in their country. But locally, we will be suffering as a country because you work hard in Kenya, you earn money in Kenya, but then you export your earnings to another country, which now expands their industries. While our own industries locally here are suffering, then we start complaining that our company is laying off staff, our company is treating employees, is paying us peanuts, but all in all, all the money you work hard for, you export it to another country. So as we look at buy Kenya, build Kenya, we need you to understand the purpose for this agenda so that when, you, when you're buying locally produced and manufactured goods, you're creating employment for other people, you are expanding our local industries and you're creating employment for yourself and your children and generations to come. And this will strengthen our economy. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mr. Kiare, for the opportunity. That is where I end it. Good. So let's appreciate this team again. Uh, can give them a clap in your own style. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nelson and the team. Uh, this is well done. I know time is uh, well spent. And we are a bit constrained, so I think I'll also take uh, just two comments only, uh, two brief comments as we conclude on this uh, presentation for this group. So we'll go as quickly as we can. So if you have a comment, uh, you can just unmute and share, or you can send on the chat and check it, uh, then we'll read it out. Okay, so Bernard Mwangi, you are saying this is awesome, well researched. Uh, one chairman, GLL, let me see that. Uh, leaders' research efforts should be actualized by picking proposals and develop them through relevant authorities. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think we are looking 
in terms of collaboration. There's a lot of good ideas coming up from this uh, uh, proposals. Probably next time when we, we, we are having such kind of proposal, we'll be trying also to engage the relevant uh, stakeholders. Uh, maybe they can come on board and just listen through and see what can happen or what we can do. Uh, if we can engage more with them. So we'll explore that. And thank you, Mr. Monkey, for that idea. Uh, okay, any other comments? Just one more comment. As you chat, as you write your comment, these are my comments for your the group. So if you're moving forward, we'll need to, again, I know we have discussed this, but we'll need again to discuss your secondary objectives. Uh, we'll need to go through them again. I have seen some gaps, so we'll need to look at that. Otherwise, the literature review for the two teams uh, has been very comprehensive, and uh, that is commendable. Uh, I think the key question here is, especially on the strategies, is what unique idea are we bringing on board? Uh, there's a lot of initiatives that have been undertaken on this area. So we'll be trying to think about what new idea are we bringing on board? Apart from what has already been done, uh, what other uh, ideas are we uh, contributing? So that's an issue that we can also check through as we continue. I have liked the idea of interfacing our products with Alibaba. I know the case of Rwanda. I think Rwanda, Rwanda's coffee is now on Alibaba. I may need to check that, but you can confirm that. Uh, so th this is really a good idea. And uh, maybe it can be even a project on itself because the key issue now is on issues of platforms. Those who have platforms, they control the systems. So either we have our own platform or we collaborate and leverage, uh, leverage on those who already have uh, platforms that are attracting the global uh, audience. So I think that's very important and uh, I like that idea. So you can check on case of Rwanda, what they have on Alibaba. I don't know if they are Kenyans product on Alibaba, that's also another area to check. So there are two aspects, either having our own or collaborating. Uh, we did an initiative for others and we came up with a platform referred to as eSoma just to promote our own local content. Uh, so I think this is something that we can engage more and see how to uh, move it on. Otherwise for the two groups, I will just want to remind you our presentation in the lesson of communication, the APE, uh, audience focused, uh, passionate, uh, and also expert. So anytime we're doing our presentation, one is that we have to be always audience focused as we have discussed, uh, so that we're able to keep on checking, are we still connecting with our audience? And two, the passion, uh, and that comes with how prepared we are and also the, the because sometimes you're presenting a very technical subject, but people must understand what you are saying. So that, that means I really need to check and understand my audience and see how do I uh, connect with my audience and also probably be testing along the way. Are we still together? So and the expert meaning you have mastered the subject and then you simplify for everybody else to be able to understand the subject. So uh, those are some of the, just the observation of it. And I think uh, we'll be engaging with cohort 10 with the observation we are getting from this uh, team so that uh, as we'll be doing our presentation, we are always improving uh, in each and every cohort. So we'll enhance more as we start uh moving towards the project proposal with the cohort 10. otherwise thanks so much i'll share these comments uh, on the chat just to help you fine tune good so i'm seeing our time is well spent and i really needed to present something uh there's a project proposal i did uh, and i thought maybe i'll just flash through just to share an idea on uh 
uh, on project proposals. I may not go into so much details because time is, we may not have a lot of time, but I'll just brush through to give you an idea of uh, a project I did on smart farming. So just allow me to flash through. So this is a project on uh, adoption of smart greenhouse farming. Uh, basically, we are talking about how you converge farming with IT. And uh, it's a benchmark of South Korea. So I'll just look through the introduction and uh, the rest, as you can see on the presentation outline. Uh, so as part of the introduction, we are saying smart farming uh, is a key. Uh, mod model of farming now. And uh, the IT, the IT is growing very wide or very fast. And uh, therefore the need to converge these two is very important. So this is what we are calling the third green revolution. Third green revolution is how we, we converge combination of ICT solutions uh, and uh, like the sensors, the GPS, the big data, and the robotics. Uh, in, the, in the Western countries and advanced countries, they're already using this. So they have already deployed this. So how we converge this, that is what we call uh, smart farming. And it entails like sensing technologies, the issues of software, the issues of communication systems, and also hardware and data. Data is very key when it comes to smart farming. So, and the key idea here is uh, how to enhance productivity because from the low manual operation of farming, the productivity level is quite low. It's also unpredictable and uh, unreliable. But as you move towards the smart farming, we have wire less wireless because we are talking about sensors, very small gadgets, but very powerful. So issues of automation are key. You can control your greenhouse from wherever you are. You can monitor your greenhouse. Uh, you can predict in terms of the quality and in terms of the quantity, and also in terms of proper utilization of resources. Water doesn't just have to pour throughout, but the sensors are able to release water at the right time. So the motivation for this project, as I was undertaking the project, uh, I was looking at the global trend on the need of IT, convergence with agriculture. There is the, the uptake of IT is quite high. So that's a big motivation. And also agriculture is a key contributor, especially when it comes to the Kenyans uh, GDP growth and uh, smart farming success story of South Korea is another key motivation. It shows us that we can do it uh, because we've seen what South Korea is doing. And uh, productivity increase, like South Korea, they were able to increase productivity by 22%, uh, labor degrees, and also operation cost. And uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, that is FAO, it predicts that the global population will reach 8 million people by 2025, and nine a billion, sorry, and 9.6 billion people by 2050. So in order to keep pace, food production must increase by 70%. So by all means, then we need to really focus on this subject of how do we increase the food production to be able to cope up with this increased number uh, of the, the population. So the problem statement, one of the issue that is very critical is the decline in agricultural land vis-a-vis -vis the increase in the population. So on one hand, uh, we are having Global population is rising, but the land is not increasing. Actually, we are, the, especially the agricultural land is not decrease, not increasing. It's either stag stagnant uh, or is decreasing in terms of uh, small portions. So this is a research that was done. Again, now uh, we are looking at uh, the the increase in population, especially now for Kenya. You can see uh, agricultural land is decreasing and then arable land uh, up to 20, 2008, 2012, it was stable. And then from 2012, it started uh, decreasing. So it's an issue of concern. We really have to take note of this. Uh, if we are, we, are to, we are to continue having sufficient food 
for the people. Again, the other problem is the scarcity of water. So the, the trend of water availability since 1950, you can see the trend, the, the, the water availability has continues to decrease. So agriculture consumes 70% of the world's fresh water supply, and therefore water management is very critical. And how do we manage water management? That is through uh, systems like greenhouse farming, but more importantly, adopting the uh, smart farming technologies. So under methodology, I looked at uh, Aziz analysis, that is the country profiles for the two countries, and also the TOE analysis, that is technology, organization, and environment, and then agriculture sector in terms of the greenhouse uh, farming. So I think I'll not go into details of this. This is the country profile. Like population for South Korea is about 50 million. Uh, Kenya, by this time, this is 2015, it was 46. But more importantly is the area square. Area square. For Korea, it's 99,000 uh, kilometers square. Kenya is 581 uh, plus uh, Kenya square. So you can see Kenya is really quite big uh, compared to South Korea. In terms of the agriculture, the uh, in terms of agriculture, like uh, we can see what are the key uh, for agriculture, Korea, it, it, the, it, agriculture contributes 2.3% to the GDP, but Kenya, agriculture contributes 30% uh, to the GDP. So uh, because uh, Korea has moved to uh, industrialized um, uh, sector, they're exporting a lot in terms of the electronic device, so they have shifted uh, their trend. So the TOE analysis for Kenya in terms of technology, we are saying uh, we are not doing badly. Mobile penetration is quite good, 80.7, uh, but now it's more, it's higher. This was earlier statistics. Uh, again, literacy level is also not bad, about 87%. In terms of the organization, there are already organizations that are mandated on the issues of agriculture. Uh, there are external tasks and task environment, that there are agencies. This is under the environment or government regulations, agencies, and the constitution also has some aspect of agriculture production, uh, which is very key in terms of uh, growing this sector. So the agriculture sector uh, for Kenya, uh, we see that the sector accounts for 65% for Kenya's total export and provides more than 60% of informal employment. So it's really a major contributor in terms of the GDP, uh, in terms of the employment, uh, provision of employment opportunities. So these are just uh, some uh, indication of where greenhouses farming is done in Kenya. So while I was undertaking this project, the goal was to design a national wide to be smart greenhouse farming solution uh, to be adopted in the 47 countries which is geared towards enhancing or increasing productivity, uh, food quality, and also management uh, of the environment, environment and uh, how we are able to efficiently utilize resources like water and energy. So the specific objectives propose a nationwide smart house green farming solution uh, for the farmers and also prepare implementation plan and identify possible distribution network of the smart farming solutions across the country. So the scope looked at issues of modernizing existing greenhouse, probably 10 per county per year, then establishing new smart greenhouses, 10 per county per year, uh, the issues of sustainability, how do we ensure sustainability, uh, and also uh, develop proposed government to farmer support system. So th this is a scope we looked from modernizing, uh, building some new ones, and also establishing at least five new smart greenhouses in each of those counties. So if we look at the case of Korea, where we, we picked a number of lessons, uh, agriculture land in Korea, it occupies around 17% of the total uh, area. 
And this has uh, increased about seven times between 1980 and 2012. Uh, but the country has continued to shift and modernize more to increase productivity. The mobile penetration is really good. It's about above 100%. It means one person can has more than one gadget. So it's like almost someone has access to a gadget or to internet and uh, not just with one gadget, but more than one. Uh, so I think I'll not go through the rest. So the project details, uh, what we were recommending for this project is wireless service, uh, remote open and control of the greenhouse, uh, remote monitoring and uh, watching the greenhouse, real-time notification for the, in case there are blackouts, uh, also in terms of the production. Once the products are ready, uh, you can notify the farmers uh, through the systems. And then there are also issues of uh, sensor connectivity, where the water is controlled. If the moisture level is low, then the, the, the sensors are able to trigger uh, for the water to, uh, to, to uh, the, the drips to release the water. So uh, the solutions are issues of solar power is because some of the areas, especially in Kenya, you may not have electricity, so solar power and uh, issues of intelligence, CCTV for security uh, and also the apps so that you can be able to communicate with the farmers. So the key lessons that uh, we were able to learn from Korea. So Korea was able to establish startup agriculture colleges, which were specialized in starting up agriculture business. Uh, they paid full tuitions by, by the government. The government paid full tuitions. And then the telecom industry also launched their own smart farm uh, service that provided enhanced greenhouse control system also at a reduced installation cost. So there was a, P, there was a, a, pub, a public private partnership uh, that helped the, the country to spearhead this project and uh, modernization and specialization in agriculture production by distributing smart farms to 40% of the modernized greenhouses. So they were able to distribute uh, and help the farmers to be able to transform their uh, greenhouse to modernized. Uh, they prioritized uh, the issues of IT to be able to, they were calling it vitamin project. Uh, and the vitamin project was just to enhance like the agriculture industry and other industries through IT systems. So the, the project funding, the estimate was about 14.1 million, that is dollars. Uh, but a feasibility study was proposed to, and to be able to uh, come up with a clear estimate. So this was the project uh, implementation schedule, starting from project design, project plan, all the way uh, to implementation. And I was estimating that within one year and a half, then the project will be able to uh, be up and running uh, for the, the counties that we had targeted. So what are the expected results? Smart greenhouse farming in Kenya, uh, would result to an, a number of key benefits like job creation, uh, increased productivity, also in terms of efficient utilization of resources like water and energy. Uh, in terms of the GDP, increased uh, economic contribution, the open market to farmers through online marketing and uh, promotion and reduced urbanization. This is important. Uh, where people are moving to the urban centers. But uh, through this, we are able to reduce urbanization by controlling the rural population from migrating to the city. So expected project challenges. Uh, one was project sustainability. How do we sustain the project because of bureaucracy and a few other issues? Site acquisition for the new smart greenhouse and also knowledge transfer and issues of fluctuating power and water supply. These are anticipated challenges, uh, which also the project tried to take care uh, by proposing other sources or alternative sources of power like, uh, like solar. So that's a summary of uh, this project. And uh, I think I'll keep sharing the project uh, even with other classes so that we can appreciate and uh, learn from our existing experience and see how well do we, uh, do we improve in whatever we are doing currently. 
So that brings us to the end of uh, this session. It has been a marathon, I know, uh, but for the cohort nine, we congratulate you, all of us congratulate you for the well done job, especially when it comes to the research. We're really proud of what you have done. So I'll communicate uh, more details on what is expected of you from now. I'll share that on the chat. Otherwise, uh, I just want to post there and say uh, Pongezi, and maybe I can just take uh, just a final comment from the team as we close. Uh, just one comment that you may want to share uh, as we close. And uh, I'll start with Mongi. Uh, your one takeaway or your one comment as we close. Uh, thank you, Bwana Chairman, even for affording us this opportunity to join cohort nine as they did their presentation. It has been a great effort uh, by the, G, the, the, the Global Leaders Network uh, to bring us on board and to pursue our courses and ensure that uh, we achieve uh, what we desire as leaders. Uh, as we move on, I think we'll, we are going to connect more and more and uh, share with those who are coming on board because I can see there is a lot of potential uh, within the leaders that are coming on board. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. We hope to share more on Tuesday uh, during the open day. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mwangi. Uh, Mr. John, any comment you may share as we close? John Obimo. Uh, thank you, Sir Joseph. Um, uh, to me, I want to first congratulate Court 9. Uh, work well done. Uh, great presentation. That's, that's all I know. I remember while we were doing ours, and uh, uh, this is a part that I want to better myself in. That's why I want to be in a number of uh, these sessions. I want to congratulate each and everyone. Thank you, Sir Joseph, for creating an opportunity for us to learn. Uh, using the minimal resources that uh, uh, that we have, and uh, we really appreciate this. May God continue blessing you and uh, uh, bless the Global leader Leadership Network. God bless you. Good, uh, good evening. Thank you so much, John. Uh, Esther, any comment you may want to share with us? I can see Rebecca. Congratulations, cohort nine. I enjoyed your discussions. That is from Rebecca. Uh, Evelyn, uh, any comment? Okay. Okay, that was good work, good presentation. And I've also at least have an idea of writing a proposal. And I'll also have to familiarize with the content. Mm -hmm. So I know I've written something that will help me when I reach that time. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Evelyn, and thank you for joining uh, this session. I'm sure we'll have a smooth time as we start a uh, project proposal with the cohort 10. Uh, Reverend Evanson, uh, any comment you may want to share with us? Okay, uh, Nelson, I don't know if there is any comment you may want to share uh, before I move to job and then I'll conclude with Morris. Uh, mine is just brief. Uh, it's just to thank you for the opportunity you've offered us, Mr. Kiari, for this global leadership uh, class. Uh, we are learning a lot and discovering our potential in areas or fields we never knew we could uh, explore. So we thank you for this opportunity, yeah. Thank you so much, Nelson. Uh, Job? Job, any comments? Okay, okay, so I think uh, we'll close there. Uh, 
just want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you for your time and patience. And uh, let's keep on to our learning agility. Uh, that, has, that, that is our spirit as Global Leadership Network, that we purposed will maintain our learning agility, even after concluding the sessions, we can come on board and be able to continue enhancing our learning agility. I see Morris is, uh, Morris is also on board. I think uh, there was a repositioning of the participants. So I missed you, Morris. Morris, you can share your comments as uh, we conclude. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. It's fine. Um, I am always in the, in lobbying, especially for manufacturing. And this class has actually made me understand there are better things we can do when we join together, especially our team. We learned a lot and we are more networked. And um, I believe we are going to take it up uh, more from where we are, from this point. What I can tell my leader's colleague is that uh, we are at a very critical moment and we need to be able to just think out of the box and just move into action with the things that we are talking about. So Mr. Chairman Kiari, I'm looking forward for actualization of some of the things that we have presented so that we can be able to leave a, leave a trail of transformative uh, uh, minds and actions of people who have picked lessons and put them into practice. Otherwise, I just want to thank you very much for the opportunity. And I believe this is indeed started so small, yes, but the impact is going to be for a bigger generation ahead of us and even the current generation. God bless you all. It's a pleasure and good night. Thank you so much, Morris. Every time you, you, you talk, you always challenge us and uh, thank you for the challenge. Uh, we really need to actualize whatever we have come up with. And I think we'll need to do a lot of monitoring just to see what projects were proposed, how far uh, do they go and what else can we be able to uh, assist the teams to make sure they actualize. Every day it's a learning experience is also for us. And uh, today we have been able to pick quite a lot from this class, which will uh, uh, put down and also just try to, uh, to digest and see how to implement. Otherwise, uh, Job, Job, I've seen your comment. You're saying I'm not being able, to, uh, I'm not being hard, but it's a pleasure being part of the program. And to my group, have been on and off, but I'm so much together with you. And then Esther. As I is saying, it was very enlightening. Congratulations to Court 9. Blessings to Chairman and Vice Chair, uh, Rebecca. So thank you to all of you. Uh, we have enjoyed uh, Court 9. We shall miss you, but we shall be with you. Uh, I know it has been a hangout session every Saturday, just being out uh, with you in this platform. And we have learned a lot. We have exchanged a lot. And we are happy to have come this far. Uh, to us, we say, God bless you. Let's keep on uh, the momentum. And uh, I'll share the more details on what follows after this. Asante Nisana, we can unmute and uh, share the words of grace together. Okay, and may the grace. With us now and forevermore. Amen. So the session has been recorded. I will share the link. Thank you so much. Have a blessed night. Thank you. Thank you.